Welcome to the Between Two Wheels podcast. We talk about all things on and between two wheels. I'm your host, Johnny Roblox, and you all know my co-host, Uncle. I look fabulous on electric scooter, yeah. Ken, and screw you guys. I'm doing my own thing. Hasso, this episode is being brought to you by Get Lowered Cycles, your one-stop shop for all things Harley and Harley related, and Nutsack, the last EDC bag you will ever want or need. On today's episode... We go over the primary differences between liquid cooling and air cooling a motorcycle motor while also discussing some changes we may be seeing from Harley. What's going on, guys? What's up? Hello. Hasso is back for episode two. Appreciate it. Doing it again. Doing it again. Now, last episode, he did a piss poor job of getting those zingers in on Justin. Yeah. And, I mean, Justin, he gets to talk so much trash about you when you're not here to defend yourself. He's over here like Ben Stein. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm it the was, new... St- I'm it, like was the a, it was a very interesting <laughs> item that we discussed I'm on the this new episode. Student, <laughs> you know, trying to hang in there. But, uh, <laughs> hopefully I'll relax better. And then yeah. my mind will go where it usually is. and The gutter? Take Justin down. Like your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, no one can see you. Don't worry about yeah. that camera. That's not that's nothing. No. <laughs> All right. So first up, let's discuss the best way to cool an engine. Ice. Ice. Dry ice? Yeah. Oh, liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen. Bark, bark. Oh, there's the puppies. All right. So as we know, Harley loves their air-cooled V-twins. However, in model year 2020, they broke the mold with the Revolution engine. Why did I say model year 2020? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so back in, oh, I, I miss, okay. In model year 2002, not 2020, I had a listexic moment there. Ah. Um, Harley built the Revolution motor. Now, for the V-Rod, the motor company teamed up with Porsche to build a revolutionary new motor for a race-worthy cruiser. The engine was significantly smaller than the Diana Softail and Touring models, yet produced insanely more power. And insanely, it's really about 30 to 45% more power, which is a lot. It really is a lot in the Harley world. Yeah. So, is there a direct correlation between power and cooling? So, if you guys don't know this, and for our listeners who don't know this, the V-Rod was the first Harley to have a radiator. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went through and looked. I couldn't find anything uh, other than the V-Rod until the new touring models. But let's go over liquid cooling, and I will mess up so all the YouTube mechanics out there, the podcast listeners who think I'm stupid, I will interchangeably call it water cooling, but it's liquid cooling. Yeah, I mean, you know, they can always contact us at info at between dot com. Thanks for that. Yeah. Tell us, tell us how. Tell us how we're wrong we are. Yeah. Okay, so liquid-cooled engines, here's some of the little aspects of them. Uh, They are higher revving, which provides for higher horsepower numbers. They run higher tolerances due to better heat management, which allows for higher RPMs. They run more efficiently, less pollution, and less heat on the back cylinder, which also helps lessen the likelihood to cause detonation. They run quieter as the water jackets insulate the sound quite a bit. And finally, because of the heat management provided by liquid cooling, the bike can maintain more consistent temperatures when running harder or when stuck in stop-and-go traffic, allowing for the rider to be more comfortable. That stop-and-go. That gets you. Yeah. And Harley did find a way to work with that. Yeah. Um, They have, I want to say. Tim's. When it came out uh, with the throttle by wire, they had it. You could put it into parade mode. Yeah, it, it, the, the ET IMS or yeah. So it, they basically they shut down a cylinder. Yeah, they shut down the rear cylinder. Yeah, um, as a way to help cool off the rider's thighs, in essence. Um, but it still gets hot. Yeah. So let's talk about air cooled engines. So they run rich causing greater pollution and higher nitrous oxide release. They run louder, which is kind of a thing for Harley. They like to be loud, but this is not the exhaust. This is the actual motor itself. The the engine, yes. Yes, It is louder than a liquid-cooled. Air-cooled engines provide more simplicity 
with one less component which could break, need to be repaired, or need to be replaced. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you got to think, you know, if, you, if you're running a, a, a water-cooled engine, if that goes down... Yeah, you're done. Your, your bike is done. You can't rely on it being air-cooled because right. they have designed it... To be water-cooled. To be water and air-cooled. <laughs> so... Um, also, air-cooled requires less maintenance overall. So liquid coolant requires for it to be changed around every 6,000 miles or so. It's really, they dub it 10,000 kilometers. So that's like 6,200 miles yeah. or so. Um, it's cheaper to build an air-cooled bike. No. Wait, no. wait. The premium motorcycle manufacturer is taking the cheap route. No. They wouldn't do that. I don't know. No, they wouldn't do that to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, we have a Harley slant on the Between Two Wheels podcast because we're all Harley riders. But we do give Harley the most grief possible when they do some stupid shit. So for all you guys who think we're Harley fanboys, we admit we are, but we are very generous with the grief. Oh, Absolutely. So, I mean, when you pay a premium price, you want a premium product. Exactly. So, and I will exactly. be critical on what I'm investing in. So. Oh, absolutely. So, for Harley, they currently have liquid cooling on some of the touring models. So, I don't remember what they call it, but in essence, the heads are cooled. Yes. Um, and on the Revolution X-powered street models, so the Street 500, the Street 750... They are actually using a variation of the V-Rod power plant. Yeah. So, funny thing is I have read that the Street 750 has higher torque and horsepower numbers than the Sportsters do. I wouldn't doubt it. I haven't I haven't fact-checked that, but I've heard that a couple times. I wonder if it's nerfed in the ECM to make it to where it doesn't actually outperform the Sportster from the factory. Mm. I mean... And you're talking about the 883, 883. Sportster. Yes, the 883, not the, 1200. not the 1200, yeah. Okay. Now, model year 2020, we're getting the Pan America and the Street Fighter, which will be powered by their newest motor, which is supposed to be another revolution-style motor, and it will be liquid-cooled. I think it's great. So, what do you guys think? Is liquid cooled better, or is air cooled better? Oh, man, you know I have to say it just depends on what kind of riding you're doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're on the highway, you know, you know, touring, cruising across America or whatever, or, you know, even between cities, you know, you have plenty of airflow. Yeah, and it's been proven by, by many manufacturers. That that works just fine. Mm-hmm. I think that where water cooling really comes in and shines is traffic. Around town, stoplight to stoplight. You know, even if you're not stuck in traffic, sitting on, you know, the highway in a traffic jam, I think that the, the water-cooled models really shine just in traffic in general. Around town, stoplight mm-hmm. to stoplight. And especially, of course, if you're stuck in traffic. Yeah. Hasa? Yeah, I agree with Uncle Ken. Um, couldn't say it any better. Um, I've ridden the street, of course, when I was training for mm-hmm. the riding academy. Um, but I was so new, I couldn't tell um, a hot bike from, a, you know. A cool bike? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then I've been on the Sportster and uh, my street glide. And all the riding we do, like you said, city traffic sucks. So I try to avoid it. Yeah. It's too hot. But now with my dual sport, this one's liquid cooled. And as you guys know, I've told you, I've, one of my reasons for buying it is to commute on it. And I've been doing that the last couple weeks, and I don't notice any heat. Well, but if we're looking at this as fairly as we can, your Street Glide has a much larger motor. Right. It's a V-twin. Is your dual sport a V-twin? No. It's a single cylinder? Right. Okay. So So it's 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 almost night and day, but just considering, I mean, it's still going to produce heat. Well, I would also say, and I haven't seen your bike, but most dual sports, dirt bikes, you sit differently on it, so you, yeah. I mean, like, I know on all of our bikes, when you sit on it and you put your feet up, your legs are wrapped around that engine. Yeah. Right. Is it the same on your dual sport? 
Um, the main difference is I've, I pretty much got mid controls on this bike versus the street glides a little more forward mm. and um, the seats longer. And I guess it's designed that way to sit forward when you're doing certain riding and sit further back. Um, so there's a lot of adjustment there and I, I sit in probably the most comfortable mid section of the seat. Um, it, doesn't feel that much difference in terms of position from mm. my legs to the motor. Well, I mean, but your legs are only like six inches long, so. Exactly. <laughs> but the cylinder is, um, it has, it, compared to the V-twin, it, it has the forward cylinder. Yeah. In it. So, I, so it, I don't have the one in the rear, you know, expecting that heat like on yeah. the street glide. And do you have, is your engine exposed or does it have fairings covering it? No, it's pretty exposed. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the, the, um, the exhaust pipe is obviously much, much thinner in diameter. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a small heat shield on it that's right in the center of what would be on my, obviously on my right leg. But I have to say, I don't I don't notice very much heat at all. And, and, I'm, and I'm riding in the city streets. I haven't been brave enough yet to get it on the freeway. Yeah. <laughs> um, even Person. though I hear you can do <laughs> it can do 80. <laughs> I've got about 65 on it, but I want to ride it more on, on some highway speeds before I jump into this does it get a little janky once you get to high speeds i didn't notice it I, maybe it's just more that i'm used to riding now um where it doesn't bother me as much of course it doesn't have a fairing or a shield that i'm used to um but uh just uh i think it was friday or thursday i was on it and i went down um some highway near my house and i think i hit 65 on it and Ooh. it didn't feel bad balling <laughs> So <laughs> i'm getting there on it getting get, get working up my um my confidence on it but uh, I've been I've been pretty happy with pretty impressed with it um but I comparing the two there's definitely no heat and Friday when I rode the street glide the heat was there <laughs> So tell us so, about your street glide what year is it It's uh 2012 uh with the 103 Do you um, have the stretch saddlebags on it No the regular saddlebags um hmm. I like the stretch saddlebags it'd be a good thing Oh well, did you know that you can win color match stretched saddlebags for your Harley No I, of course I know, because I listen to the number one motorcycle podcast. Ah, I love it when people suck this up. Gang. Well, Advan Black has hooked us up with a set of bags to raffle off to help us raise money for Project Clean Slate, where we get a Harley, customize the hell out of it, and give it away to a veteran. Here's the bonus. With Between Two Wheels being a 501c3 nonprofit organization, you can write off your donation on your taxes as a charitable giving. Head over to BetweenTwoWheels.com, the two is spelled out T-W-O, and click on the Project Clean Slate to enter for your chance to win today. Now, with the Pan America and the Street Fighter, the Custom, the Streets, the Twin Cooled Touring Models, are we seeing a shift with Harley Davidson moving to water cooling. That is coming up after the break. Nutsack is the only EDC bag the crew carries, and for good reason. They're crazy and awesome. They get their name because folks said they had to be nuts to manufacture a man bag in America with American waxed canvas, American leather, and American labor. We want you to join us in the two-week challenge. Buy a bag from them, use it for two weeks, and if it doesn't completely change the way you carry your everyday gear, they will give you a full refund. We absolutely love ours from carrying around extra mags for our concealed carry to earbuds sunglasses vape stuff and business cards it is great having less shit in our pockets and it was because of the nutsack satchels that we were able to be less weighed down if you buy using our link nutsack will give you five dollars off to enjoy a beer head over to nutsack.com slash b2w that's n-u-t-s-a-c dot com slash be the number two w to get yours today we are back so in august harley's latest patent hit the patent office website so every major motorcycle media group jumped on it but it is showing some promise a new big v-twin is coming in the near future and with a new overhead valve design with higher revs we may be looking at the first big twin that is built to be liquid cooled. Now I have a question mark on this because it doesn't specifically state it, but with the design of how they're doing this, it looks like that that could be the direction they're going. So what is actually going on here? Current Harley pushrod configurations in the Milwaukee eight moves a pair of rocker arm shafts 
that control the two intake and two exhaust valves. This new engine will get rid of the rocker shafts and move to a single rocker arm design, which will take the current setup of the four push rods on the right side and move one of those per cylinder over to the left side. Hmm. So <laughs> why is this important? So since the F head motor, so from 1914, all Harley Davidson engines have had their push rods locate on the same side of the motor, the right side. This is a new radical design <laughs> for Harley and will allow for a big change in the motor's performance capability. Now, the fact that they're moving the push rods doesn't actually change anything from the aesthetics other than it's no longer going to have four of them on one side. Yeah. It's going to have, you know, two and two. But the reason for this is because of that new rocker arm. The way it functions, the push rods have to be aligned to be able to make it because it's it's moving one one arm. Yeah, yeah. So like a seesaw. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you hear about st when I hear about stuff like this, and you think like like you said since 1914, yeah, they've had them on the same side. Mm -hmm. All right. How much of that was for? heritage like or we've always done it this way that i think that is what it is Staple. i mean th th i mean that's but, really what it, what i wonder is like you know when they see when when they've been doing it this way for forever mm -hmm. and other motorcycles don't well indian does you know what i'm saying is not you know other in, other motorcycle industries don't always you know run them on the same side right now for like the, the big V-twins, the two biggest manufacturers of them, Indian and Harley, they both were doing it this way. And it's because of the head design. The head design is very similar yeah. in how they operate. And it looks like they're trying to actually build some performance into this. And we're seeing it more and more, this shift in building better heads for the V-Twins. And if you go and start looking at these manufacturers, the aftermarket, like S&S heads, all these things, they're having to build, I would say, lower performing performance parts because of the method in which the Harley motors are in, and the Indian motors are operating. Yeah. So they're finally, in the patent at least, they're showing the, the attempt to get away from that and actually start looking at performance. Making progress. Yeah. There, it, it only takes a hundred and some odd years to get there. Oh, uh, yeah. But I mean, but today the Milwaukee eight. So they're the biggest V twin they have red lines at 5,500 RPMs. However, the new motor is claimed to have a red line around 6,800 to 7,000 RPMs. Does this actually matter? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. One hundred percent. It does. Yeah. Higher revs allow engines to reach higher horsepower levels. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, you, you know, when you, when you go from, well, look, look, look at it this way: if you tie a rope around your ankles, and that rope is only a foot long, you can only go so fast. Right. If you make that rope two feet long, you can now move faster. Yeah. It's just in the most basic of, of sure of sense. So. A lot of people don't understand what horsepower and torque actually do. Now, we kind of discussed this in our uh, Sport Bike Spec Sheet Shootout episode, so last episode. However, just to clear it up, torque moves you. Yes. Horsepower continues to move you and dictates how fast you move. Yeah. So that's the bare bones basics. And horsepower has a direct correlation to RPM. Mm -hmm. RPM is part of the equation for how they come up with horsepower. Right. So there is a fixed equation, and I'm going to find it. I'm going to put it in the show notes for this episode so people can see it. But torque is how you do work. Horsepower is how quickly you do it. That's the easiest way of yep. looking at it. So 
Go ahead. You wanted to say something. Yeah. You, you got to jump in, buddy. Yeah, I'm seeing that. Um, <laughs> I think this episode ties into, I think it was two episodes ago, with about the, the millennial episode. Uh-huh. And why I think it's important that um, Harley moves forward with a newer, different design, maybe better engine, is because of the availability of information and the technology that's available to do it. Yeah. Nowadays, you can sit down and talk about horsepower and torque like we are. But in the older days, or not too long ago, but now you can get online and actually see charts and yeah. com- make comparisons. Oh, yeah. And I think this the newer generation, that's what they'll do. Because oh, it absolutely. Because it can be proven. I mean, I mean, I do that. Exactly. You, you know, for, for anything I'm buying, right? I do that. There's, and I want to see, you know. You want it in writing. I want to see what the <laughs> manufacturer claims. And what's actually and being then done. I want then I try and find what people are actually getting what yeah what the actual street results are the common consumer uh, can easily compare it with dyno runs and these things so it's no longer can the manufacturer just say oh or oh yeah order performs this way okay I'm gonna go test that on my own oh yeah and then I'm gonna expose you on exactly whatever. they can't just make broad claims anymore yeah, exactly. because because so, yeah, I mean, you, you can do exactly that. Since the the growth of the internet, everything went from being, okay, it's 225 horsepower to now it's 225 brake horsepower. So then they're not getting busted for false advertising. They're able to say, well, that's what the horsepower is at the flywheel. So before it goes through oh, yeah. the degrading powertrain, Oh man, they're they're full on howling now. Oh, I think yeah. it's lunchtime. You know, that's what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, n- now because we all know powertrain will significantly drop your power by about twenty percent or so. And for our listeners, that is four dogs <laughs> going ape shit. Unhappy about something. Four dogs. Ha ha ha. Cry me river deep. <laughs> try so, five. Five. Try five dachshunds. <laughs> <laughs> they will sing to you. Are, they're losing it. Maybe are it's because of the special guest. Are we getting robbed? Oh, I don't know. Is, is this a home invasion? Is my bike no, stopped? I'm or? thinking someone knocked on the door or something. Delivery. Anyways, getting yeah. back to our <laughs> podcast. With all this information about liquid-cooled versus air-cooled motors, higher RPM coming out of new configured heads, where does this actually take Harley? As we saw in the Revolution engine co-designed by Porsche, it was a lower displacement, higher revving, liquid-cooled motor that produced more overall power than any other Harley motor before it. With that said, let's look at the motor going into the Pan America and the Street Fighter. These are lower displacement, Mm -hmm. liquid-cooled. We won't know the actual torque and power numbers until they're released, but I am betting we will see a higher revving, higher horsepower motor that will knock the socks off the big twin Milwaukee 8. Oh, absolutely. So, that that becomes an issue. Now, the, the new motors going into the Pan American Street Fighter, they're a modular motor. So, what they're meaning with that, they can have one plant with multiple displacements. Yes. And all they're doing, and this is a Harley tradition, is they're changing the stroke mm-hmm. on it. They're not really changing the bore too much. No. Not, usually not the bore. It's usually, like I said, the stroke yep. and your, your heads. Yeah. So, this is telling me that Harley will have to do something for both the Touring and the Softail families to ensure their flagships remain desirable to the mass markets. Agreed. Now, no matter what Harley does, if they make one slight change, all the Harley owners oh, are going to go apeshit about it. Yep. Oh, yeah, they're going to cry a freaking and flood. if the purists really want Harley-Davidson to never change anything, they need to go out and buy more bikes. Oh, well, yeah. Right. If, if, if the older generation Harley riders are still sitting on their 2016 motorcycles, they can't expect Harley to do, you know, to not change anything to bring in other buyers. That's just not how it works. Well, I mean, perfect example, me. 
I've got a 2015. It's got the 103 in it. Mm-hmm. Okay. The 16, 17, 18, and 19 models weren't offering anything significantly greater than what I have now. Well, the Milwaukee 8 is a much better power plant than the twin cam. It, it is. It is, but there's not a gigantic leap right. in performance there. And also, of course, I keep hearing all the trouble that Milwaukee 8s are having right. at the moment. But, well, I think I, I, mean, I have a total of like 11,000 miles across three. Is that on your... All three okay, Milwaukee yeah. 8s that I've say, owned. Not Those on your did truck. get out of the break-in period, right? Go fuck yourself, man. Yeah. The Road King barely made it out. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, you know, from kind of back two episodes ago to our millennial episode. Three episodes Three ago. episodes ago. You know, they're not giving me anything great that is pulling me in. Like, I really, like the infotainment system, sure, love it. I really want it. Yes. But the motor that comes with it, <clears throat> aside from, you know, having less vibration, yes, they are better performing, mm-hmm. but they're not greatly outperforming what I have. Right. I mean, yeah, we, we go on a ride, you know, and sure, you can take off faster, but eventually I still catch up. Yeah. Our, our top end still the same. Yeah. <laughs> so there's nothing fantastic there. Right. And right. I think that that this new engine will, will absolutely play a big part in that. Yeah. Now, it took six months from the time that Harley applied for the patent for it to actually get to public domain. Yeah. I'm wondering when the new power plant's going to hit there. So they may have already filed the patent on it, and we just haven't seen it yet. But I do have some searches set up to automatically crawl (laughs) the patent office website to see when anything from Harley gets dropped. Oh, yeah. So and, and, and you know, and back to like the the Pan America, mm-hmm. you know, and having the the new motor, the, it's a dual sport bike. Yeah. So you you know, it's designed designed quote unquote designed right. to be able to go off road. Well, when you're off road and you're climbing on dirt, you know, and climbing on rocks and stuff like that, you need those higher RPMs to carry you through you can't lug the engine expect to get somewhere yeah torque's not going to get you there no that's why dirt bikes are horsepower machines yes so i feel that this is just another step in the future of harley that will help keep it viable in the heavyweight motorcycle market yet still be viewed as a great bike for the younger generations Um, and i know our gen x listeners are going to hate me for saying this but the younger generation of riders are quickly becoming, if they haven't just recently, become the largest purchasing segment in the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. So right now, I believe I saw something on this last week that the millennials are the largest, they have the largest purchasing power. And if companies don't, adhere to what millennials are looking for they're going to fail because let's face it as gen xers retire their disposable income shrinks oh yeah and you know generally drastically i mean just look at uh, like my mom she's on social security yeah you know so she she doesn't she she's on a fixed income absolutely if and you know and if she wasn't living you know with my sister and whatnot and it just she wouldn't be able to buy just, you know, whatever she wants. Right. Right. So that's, that's things we have to think about. So what are you, what are your thoughts on this? I know we kind of jumbled in through out, but do you feel that this is the proper step for Harley to take? Yeah, absolutely. So when we, they have, they have too much to lose. They have all to yeah. lose. Yeah. I mean, they are still the number one heavyweight motorcycle in sales mm-hmm. in America. But EPA standards, well, okay, with Trump in office, we don't really know what's happening with the EPA standards. But in the rest of the world, the environmental standards are getting tighter. Oh, very much so. Air-cooled motors cannot keep up. No. 
No, and no, I, no. I have to hand it to Harley for all the shit we talk about them not being technologically advanced. Right. They've done a fantastic job keeping their bikes within the regulations and still being an air cooled motor. Yeah. Now, when them going to the twin cooled motors on the touring bikes, it makes sense. And I have to hand it to them the design looks good you don't see you the don't radiator even, you don't even notice it it's inside of the little glove box on the lower fairing yeah and the only thing you, the only way you know is the water hose is coming out that's the only way you know yeah. that and it you, is you gotta be up close to notice that even. yeah so i have to hand it to harley for making it this long you know 117 years yeah with a air-cooled motor i mean i mean really yeah I mean, you, you look at all the other brands that are out there. They're almost they're almost all of them are moving to water cooled. Yeah. yeah. So Indian is still producing primarily air cooled motors, but their new Scout sixty mm-hmm. is liquid cooled. Yep. Because they're pushing the limits on that motor to pull out more power. Well, yeah, and and you know, like I said, if if they're moving the RPM range up to seven thousand and eight thousand RPMs. You have to have a better way to cool that motor. Yeah, period. And the tolerance level. People, there's so much, there's so low tolerances in the Harley motors. Oh, yeah. Because it has to be able to dissipate the heat. Oh, yeah. Or as Tracy says, dissipate the heat. Dissipate. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, I don't know. I, I, I really think that Harley has to do this. And they have a long enough history now of proof of concept with oh, that yeah. revolution motor that they can do it. Get a high performing motor. Get something that and a little side note here. I have found a lot of V rods that have been converted into road glides. Really? So they have a shark nose fairing on it, they have saddlebags. Have to go look that yeah. But it's still a V rod. I Badass. see a lot of opportunity here for Hardy to take advantage of both crowds you know the purists keeping the you know or wanting the air-cooled motor and the transition into a better performing liquid cooled newer technology wise motor yeah to win over the new generation because like i said you know they're going to be looking at statistics and specs and compare it paper to paper versus experience to experience of the equipment yeah wow these these look awesome. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can't even tell hardly. No, they they do a fantastic job. Wow. And they are fast as hell. So I don't know. I think the biggest issue for Harley is going to be on their non-touring bikes because they've shown that they can hide the radiators. And liquid cooling, if you look at like the Honda Shadows, you see the big ass radiator and that's a detractor for a lot of people. A lot of the Harley purists, they don't want to see that radiator, Mm -hmm. but then these are the same people who have no problems putting the big chin spoiler on their bike. Yeah. And honestly, the chin spoiler doesn't look bad, but you could hide a radiator behind that. Oh yeah. And just have like a black grill that covers it up and no one's going to notice the difference. Oh yeah. And and honestly, I think well, and with the technology we have nowadays, yeah, they you know it's all designed in a computer. Yeah, it's all CAD. Yeah. So, I just I hate it when this the alleged purists is what the companies are trying to appease. When at the end of the day, the company's job is to appeal to the mass market, yeah. and I'm hoping. And it won't happen because it's Harley, but I'm hoping that they'll start thinking about price point and start thinking about how do they, how can they do better for the environment? Air cooling, you can't. No. Um, they, I think they have reached their pinnacle on the air cooled motors. Right. Now we do know that there are some kits out there that you can take the Milwaukee eight to 128 cubic inches and all that. And that's fine. I'm not talking about that type of yeah. uh, performance packaging from a manufacturer. I'm talking about just everyday stock manufactured motorcycles. Well, and, and a cooler motor lasts longer. It does. I mean, that's just fact. It It's more efficient. Yeah. And you know. efficiency 
it goes across the entire spectrum of performance, not just, you know, you can have a higher revving motor to get the higher horsepower and better torque curves I mean, and things heat, like that. Heat destroys. Yeah. You can keep, and, and honestly, we live in a disposable society today. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe creating a motor that will last for 100,000 miles, maybe not. that's not what they want. You know, well, of course you, not. you could be right. No. I mean, I see companies like Frigidaire pumping out thousands of refrigerators a day. And I'm like, who's buying all these refrigerators? But refrigerators aren't lasting like they used to. Oh, no. <laughs> so, five, five years? Yeah, five, seven, eight years. Yeah. But, but motorcycles, these are vehicles. And we all know. If you go look at a 1969, 1970 muscle car, look at the motor in that, and then you go look at the aluminum blocked motors today in the same models, like the Mustangs, the Camaros, things like that, vastly different, and oh. they're not going to last as long. Oh, no. I so, mean, yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, for me, I think this is a good sign now, and I, I have to say there was no mention of liquid cooling in the patent but you can infer it oh yeah because the only way they're getting the higher tolerances for the higher rpms is they're going to have to come up with a better heat management system absolutely so our closing argument and this is a nice shorter episode for our listeners but would having a radiator on your bike really upset you from a design perspective hasso it would depend on the design obviously um i think if the if it looks right if it's designed right and it's providing me the functionality that it should it it's fine i, I don't mind i mean look at my dose board it's got a radiator and it's but it's kind of enclosed in the fairing that it has and you can hardly see it really mm-hmm. and i like it I, I mean i don't mind it so um it wouldn't upset me at all no yeah ken no wouldn't hurt my feelings at all i mean you did, know. did you know you already have a a radiator on your bike? Yeah. Did you for the oil cooler? Yeah. 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 We right up right up front, right there in front and bottom. Yeah. Mine's got a chrome cover on it. Of course, you're of course you're fucking does. got your chromosexuals. <laughs> Damn Gen X. But but no, it it, it doesn't bother me. You pe- know? People didn't even know what that was. They had no clue that that was an oil cooler. I mean, it is sitting right next to your oil filter. Yeah. But. They, they didn't know that that was an oil cooler. I think if they just maybe do what some of the car companies are doing and stacking the radiators, oh, you, well, could, you could design it in a way that it's completely hidden. On, on the frames of almost every single Harley, <clears throat> right there in front, right above your oil clu- cooler, you could put a radiator there right. for yeah. water cooling. And, I mean, it, it's not holding a whole lot of liquid or don't have it hold any liquid in there don't have don't have that be the reservoir have the water running through there but have your reservoir somewhere else yeah you could build the reservoir into the gas tank i mean you could yeah or and into the frame or any number of places yeah, i mean buell buell showed that that hollow frame can be utilized for other things yeah like fuel oil so you could put a one gallon uh, liquid containers or whatever you, the the liquid tank for it, you could hide that. Especially oh. you know on the touring models all day easy, long. Easy enough, yeah. But the real the real aspect here are the soft tails because mm-hmm. it's going to be in your face. It's going to be visible. I think on the Sportster line they could do it and no one would question it because they'd do it in the, pretty much the same fashion they did they did on the street. I don't mm-hmm. hate the street. I like the street. Yeah, the street's I nice. Like I just, for me being my size, yeah. it doesn't make sense. Well, yeah. It looks like a gorilla humping a football. I mean, that's one <laughs> of the reasons I bought the Rogue Glide is versus, you know, like a diner or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I was an E3 in the Navy when I bought my soft tail. Now, given it was because of an accident that I had a massive down payment to be able to put on it, you know, but... I bought the bike I could afford. And the only oh, yeah. reason I could afford that was because of the massive down payment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So those are things to consider. What are y'all's thoughts? Hit up the Instagram post for this episode and let us know 
what you think about a radiator being put onto a Harley Davidson frame. Do it. Thank you for tuning in to Between Two Wheels podcast to see the show notes for this and all of our episodes, to find links to our social media and Patreon page where we are raising money for Project Clean Slate, head over to our website at www.betweentwowheels.com. The two is spelled out T-W-O. On behalf of Justin, Uncle Ken, I am Johnny Roblox saying, be yourself unless you're a jerk. Then be someone better. Peace. I, 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 I